from Melbourne has an interesting question, um, as I know many people personally who have dealt with this, uh, so it's a funny one for me. My in-laws would like to be at my next birth. I've said yes, but now I'm second guessing. What should I do? I don't want to hurt their feelings. Okay, Kathy, so, um, you have to kind of approach this situation with finesse because obviously, you know, we love our in-laws, we respect them. Uh, in some instances, they drive us absolutely crazy, but it's a sensitive situation. First of all, I'd like to say that you're ultimately the one who has to make this decision. It's your birth space and a birth space is very sensitive. The energy that goes into it is really, really important. And so regardless if it's your in-laws, your friends, your brothers, your sisters, and whoever else, if anyone's going to impede on that energy, they shouldn't be there, full stop. Now, in-laws can be a bit particular because you don't want to, you know, deprive them of that experience of witnessing um, their grandchildren being born, and I can totally empathize with that. But it's important to put your foot down in this kind of situation. So even though some, you know, family members might feel like their heart's in the good place and that they just want to be actively involved, it can really deter on your experience and in some instances actually hinder you physically um, from your, your labor progressing. One of the biggest and most important parts of um, a successful labor is an ability to let go and lose control in the best way possible. Um, you know, you're going to be nude, you're going to be vulnerable, it's you know, going to be a time where you're probably quite loud, um, quite emotional. And in some instances, I don't even feel comfortable being like that around some of my greatest friends. So um, I love my in-laws, but I think that they'd probably be a little freaked out by the way that I act in the birth space. So for their sake and for mine, I'd probably keep it a private affair. Again, completely up to your call. It's your birth, your decision. And if you're second guessing it, honey, it probably means that it's not the right energy. Thank you for your question, Kathy. So we have a question from Abigail in South Australia. Abigail asks, what should I look for when finding a maternity care provider? Abigail, one of the things that I really recommend uh, most in pregnancy is hiring a care provider that is on the same page as you right from the get-go. And this really helps you set up the foundation you need to create a birth experience that's most authentic to you. And, and it actually increases your um, chances of having a birth experience that is satisfying and fulfilling. So a few things that you're going to look for are, first of all, if they're um, open about speaking about their cesarean and VBAC rates, um, if they are, you know, inducing, so what their induction protocols are, um, what their protocols are in terms of dates, um, how comfortable they feel going over dates, um, do they insist on vaginal exams early on in labor, do they insist on vaginal exams at all, um, are they open to discussing uh, risks, benefits, alternatives, and are they happy with you saying no in um, a lot of instances. I think most people don't put enough time and energy into actually um, fully looking into their options and their care providers, whereas if I was hiring a personal trainer or anything else that's service-based, you bet your bottom dollar that I'd be asking questions and, you know, screening people, making sure that they have the same values as me and making sure that they're on the same page so that I can get the service I need um, at its full capacity. So something that I can't stress enough, be open, upfront, ask a million questions and make sure that they're there to support you in any way that you need them to and that you're not falling into a trap that requires you to be um, submissive right from the start. Thanks for that question, Abigail. Michael from the Blue Mountains has a question about birth photography and we all know how much I love that. Michael asks, my wife would love a birth photographer for the birth of our next child, but it's still an expense and I'm not sure I'm willing to fork out the cash for it. I'm a very private person on top of that, so will it affect the birth space? Michael, those are very valid concerns, but I'm a massive advocate for birth photography and I'll tell you why. In my honest opinion, I would never birth without the presence of a birth photographer, ever. It is a one-off experience that can never be replicated. And for this reason on its own, I just wouldn't risk it. 
It's one of those things where when a woman is in labor and she's really in the throes of it and she enters something called labor land and her mind is really doped up on all these beautiful you know, hormones and chemicals and these natural drugs, she often doesn't remember what's happening in those moments, you know, leading up to the actual delivery of the baby, meeting baby, so much adrenaline and all this beautiful stuff happening. She becomes lost in the moment. And one of the biggest things that my clients tell me afterwards is, my goodness, I'm so glad that I have these images to look over because I don't remember half of what happened. And they have these images not only to, you know, look at and, and redigest and rehash some of the most magical moments of their life, but they have these beautiful, um, you know, fleeting moments that they can pass on generations to generation. You know, this is something that you can share with your child, with your grandchildren when they're 20, 30, 40 years old and say, hey, look, this is when you entered the world. Uh, we put in all this effort into making sure that you, you know, you came and loved and supported and I just think that's so precious and so special um, and I'm so excited about sharing those things with my daughter and, and our next son, you know, when they're older. So for those reasons alone, it's worth its weight in gold. And what frustrates me is that so many people are happy to fork out, you know, five, ten thousand dollars on a wedding photographer, for example, and a wedding photographer has the ability to plan, um, you know, and it would be the equivalent of hiring a wedding photographer. but not telling them when you're actually getting married, um, possibly calling them at three in the morning because you want to get married at four in the morning, that, that you know, your wedding might last for 35 hours and that it's a high emotional, high stress environment. And yet you're happy to pay a wedding photographer thousands of dollars and you question paying a birth photographer, you know, a thousand to document something that's of epic proportions. So for myself, it's more of, you know, not having to convince people, it's just stating the obvious. Like it's just, it's the best decision you'll ever make and I cannot advocate it for that enough. Um, for my first daughter's birth, we basically didn't know anything about, you know, doulas or birth photographers or whatnot. And we had the really beautiful chance of meeting a woman named Naomi and she actually runs um, uh, Acorn and Oak, uh, sorry, Acorn and Oak Birth Photography in Ontario with her husband. And she said, hey, I'm getting into birth photography. Do you mind if I, I, I'm there to capture your daughter's birth? And I was like, hey, you know what? Cool, let's do it. <sighs> you have no idea how happy I am that I have those images and I'm forever indebted to her. Um, you know, our daughter's almost two and I still look at those photographs routinely and sob like a little baby because I can see the emotion in my face and I can see how raw and how vulnerable I was and how elated my husband and I were and her little squishy old woman face you know that's something that my old brain will forget in time but now I have that ability to look at those images and remember them forever so if that's not convincing enough Michael I don't know what else to tell you thanks for that question Melanie from Port Lincoln has a question that I think uh, needs addressing as it is quite important um, Melanie asks I am a survivor of sexual abuse and um, I'm suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Are there alternative ways to check dilation because I do not feel comfortable with vaginal exams? Um, Melanie, I do feel for you. I meet many women who are in these really um, sensitive situations and I do think that this needs to be spoken about. But dilation exams tend to be common um, practice and protocol in hospitals and it's just become a part of the policy over time. One that I think needs addressing desperately uh, because I don't think it is appropriate whatsoever. I don't mind being bold about these statements uh, because it is a known fact by now that vaginal exams are extremely inaccurate. So at the very, you know, at the very best, when you are checked with, um, with hands, so keeping in mind that everyone has different size hand, different size fingers, um, when you're on your back and when you're standing up, you get all sorts of different measurements. At the very best, you're getting a snapshot of where you are in that moment at time in those few minutes. Dilation can change within seconds. So, you know, a woman can be two centimeters and then progress to 10 centimeters um, in a matter of minutes, within an hour. And so you're only getting a snapshot, like I said, of that exact moment. A vagina is not a crystal ball. I read that on the internet once and I thought, my God, that is genius, because it's not. 
You don't look at your vagina, you know, put some fingers in and all of a sudden everything's clear as day. You're gonna give birth in five hours. No, that is a load of crock and it is not accurate and it's not fair to put that pressure on women. Um, so first of all, let's just get that out of the air, okay? The inaccuracy of, of vaginal checks. There are alternative ways to check dilation and you nailed it by asking that. So let's go through a couple of them. From a outsider's point of view, you can look at things like a cleft. And this is essentially between your butt cheeks, you'll get a purple, dark red, bluish line that will slowly but surely climb its way to the top of your, of your bum crack, for lack of better words. And in most in instances, this actually provides a more accurate um, indication that a woman is in really well-established labor and uh, she's dilating in a really beautiful way. And so I've had my most recent climb had the most beautiful purple line, just gorgeous. And it was climbing and climbing and climbing. And by the time it passed her, um, you know, right above her butt, we're like, okay, now we can go to the hospital. And when we got there, she was nine centimeters in really, you know, great active labor. And I thought, yeah, we used it. We used that alternative method and it worked. Other things you can look for are uh, noises that a woman makes in labor. So primal vocalizations and, you know, grunting, almost really animal noises. This will give you a strong indication that she's in the throes of labor. Like, I mean, she's rocking and rolling and she's dilating and there's, there is some magical things happening within her lady parts. Other things you can look at, for example, are emotions, emotional indicators. So as a woman gets closer to something called transition, this is when you know your cervix is just open and wide, you'll notice that women are extra vulnerable, extra emotional, they're starting to feel defeated, they're begging for drugs, they're saying, you know, put the baby back in me, I'm done, you know, I give up. These are really massive, strong indicators that she's actually getting very, very, very close. And then you can look at other things as well, like just general demeanor and time and how a woman acts and how she's moving. I really feel like paying attention to a woman's physical and emotional cues is so much more accurate than relying on, um, you know, the picture that you get painted from a few fingers in a, in a vaginal check. I just think, I think it's an outdated practice, I'll be completely honest. And I am a strong believer in a hands-off approach in labor. And uh, I just get so excited when I see, you know, midwives, for example, who who just leave a woman be. They don't need to touch her. They don't. They don't need to do anything. They can see through experience that she's in labor and she's going to have a baby. You're giving back, you know, power to a woman when you leave on a hands-off approach. You know, you're giving a woman an ability to connect to her body physically, and you're giving her the chance to to figure it out on her own. You will know when you're in the labor, you will know when you're in active labor, and so will the medical professional. So don't feel like you need to be you know, forced into doing any vaginal checks. Um, women come from all different walks of life, and whether it's you know, from physical trauma, um, obstetric violence, sexual abuse, you know, ethical, religious reasons, you don't need to do anything that you do not feel comfortable with. So please just remember that and look into some more methods. Thanks for your question.